Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a great day today. My name is Mike Rosehart and today I'm talking about the 8% rule or the 8% safe withdrawal rate where you factor real estate and rental properties into your entire portfolio to generate more cash flow and retire sooner. You can retire in as little as five years where maybe you would have spent 10 years to retirement by simply changing the asset allocation of your portfolio. This is gonna be a whiteboard video where I talk about the 8% rule and how the 8% rule can actually allow you to retire with half the amount of money you thought you needed. So if you thought you needed a million dollars to retire, you can do it on 500,000. If you thought you could do it on 500,000, you could probably do it on 250,000. Maybe you thought you needed a couple million and you find out 500,000 might be more than enough. And maybe even it's only a few rental properties away. So mixing in real estate into the safe withdrawal rate and how to retire earlier with real estate investing. So let's get to it. I've talked on my channel before about the 4% rule or the 4% safe withdrawal rate to determine how much you can withdraw from your portfolio and live on in retirement and how you can reverse engineer that equation to figure out how much you need to retire and moreover, how you can retire in less than five years. Today's video is gonna be a little bit of a spin on the original 4% safe withdrawal rate to determine how you could retire a little bit faster by mixing in rental properties and real estate into your retirement portfolio to produce passive income and passive cash flow that you can live off and hopefully generate more cash flow than you could with just a straight standard, you know, 70% equities, 30% bonds, or some mix thereof. So I'm calling it the 8% rule to differentiate from the 4% rule. It is exactly as it sounds, double the returns. And so we're gonna get into some of the math behind how I got to where I got to using my own rental property portfolio to break down exactly how much cash flow I'm getting, how much I will get in a worst case scenario, and then from there back out average inflation, average appreciation on real estate, and mix that in with a standard stock equity portfolio and talk about the asset allocation differences and how you can juice a little bit more returns safely without ever touching the principal on your investment and live just on that passive income while still reinvesting some of the proceeds back into your portfolio so it'll grow and outpace inflation hopefully so you never run out of money and that money continue to generate wealth for future generations to come. So the 8% rule or the real estate safe withdrawal rate has come up a ton on Instagram and on my channel. People are reaching out because I talk about real estate investing and saying, Mike, this 4% safe withdrawal rate seems really, really low. It's predicated on a six to seven and a half percent return based on like S&P 500 stock returns and boring weak returning bonds. But if you didn't have any bonds in your portfolio and instead invested in rental properties and maybe even went a little further and used the bank's money or 20% down payment of your own and 80% of the bank's money in the form of a mortgage and then bought cash flowing real estate, you could then use the bank's money to generate a greater return and therefore potentially 15 or 20% return with very little risk tied to real estate that is cash flowing and assuming that real estate doesn't appreciate because I don't want to bet on appreciation just on the rental income profit. And so I thought this would be a good topic to break out into space and get people who are maybe looking at getting their first rental property interested in real estate and why I got interested in real estate and why it became a huge hobby and then eventually a big side hustle for me. And that was because the returns from real estate are very attractive in many markets across the world. Less so in the major metropolitans, but outside of those areas, there are tons of opportunities for cash flow. So what does the 8% rule really mean? The 8% rule means exactly as the 4% rule, but double the sustainable cash flow and sustainable returns. So if you had $500,000 in your entire net worth, to invest in your portfolio. That 500,000 should produce $40,000 of income for the rest of your life inflation adjusted. So in year two of retirement, it will produce you know, 40,000 times 2% or 40,800 approximately. In year three, it will produce $42,000 in income and your income will scale and grow with inflation and you will never touch your principal. In down years, you will have to rely more on your real estate income from your rental properties and potentially even some of your emergency fund. And then in up years, you have the chance to sell some of your stocks off and cash in on those capital gains, but it relies on the fact that you will not run out of money with a 96 to 99% probability. Using my real estate rental portfolio, it's pretty much zero. Nothing's zero, but very, very low chance of running out of depleting the principal. And of course, we can always just go out 
and put a little bit of extra time or effort into our portfolio. For instance, we could fire our property managers and manage the properties ourselves to save a little bit more and get a little bit more cash flow in those tight times if we really had to. Now that's not really passive, but I'm just saying you could go and generate some extra income in times of disparity. So keep that in mind for the naysayers who are gonna jump in the comments and say, 8% safe withdrawal rate is not possible, Mike. It is, stay tuned, we're gonna go through the numbers in a little while here. But what does that mean? What does the 8% rule mean for you? It means you can retire a hell of a lot sooner than you thought you could. If you thought, hey, my annual desired spending is about $25,000 a year to have the life that I wanna live because I'm house hacking and you know I'm living a relatively modest life, guess what? Your annual spending divided by the 8% rule gives you the fire number, gives you the number that you need to retire right now. And let's go through example. 25,000 divided by the 8% rule will give you $312,500. That means that if you wanted to have $25,000 of passive income using the 8% safe withdrawal rate rule, you would need $312,000 saved up. Now that might sound like a lot to some people, but a lot of people might say, hey, that's not very much money. If you go on Google and you type in you know, Dave Ramsey or you type in some of the other big bloggers in the space, you'll find they're, they're often quoting one, two, three, four million dollars to retire. And I'm telling you, you can retire on like $300,000 and produce $25,000 a year for an infinity of passive income without ever depleting your principal. So that's where real estate's really attractive. When people reach out to me, they say, well, Mike, what should my asset allocation look like? And the answer is it depends. It depends on a lot of factors. Your time horizon depends on you know, so many different things that come into play. But I personally feel like bonds and treasury bills and GICs are just a terrible place to put your money. I feel much more comfortable investing in real estate in Canada, in markets where I feel very comfortable and buying below market value. So I can go in there and I can buy real estate at slightly below market value. So that gives me a bit of an edge as well. But buying real estate that's relatively safe, right? Long-term real estate has pretty much just gone up. If you held real estate over a 10-year period, you'll never have lost money ever. Even in 2008 in the US, it's all recovered within seven to 10 years. So if you take a long-term horizon perspective and say, I'm gonna hold this real estate for a long time, I'm only concerned about my cash flow, then you will be perfectly fine. And so that's been the philosophy that I've always had. And so we're gonna get into some of the asset allocation. So one example that I used for the math in this specific 8% rule calculation, because you can actually get a 12% rule and a 15% rule using real estate, which is crazy because of leverage. You can borrow the bank's money at like 3% and then put up 20% down payment. And I'll explain in a second about how that gets your returns juiced way up. And it's not a lot of risk because the rental income from your real estate portfolio covers the debt payments on your mortgage. So it's not like you're having to carry that debt, so it's not like it's a huge risk. And if you're cash flow positive, you never have to sell. Plus you have things like mortgage pay down. Plus you have things like natural organic market appreciation. Plus you have opportunities to add value to your property, which are all things in your favor to building long-term wealth and sustaining you from having to ever touch the principal on your retirement portfolio, because that's the worst thing that can happen. That's why we have these rules, like the 8% rule, the 4% rule, so that we know when we retire on X dollars, we know that we can live off that passive income and not have to touch the principal ever. That is the golden rule. You wanna stay retired, you never touch the principal of what you've saved. You only ever touch some of the growth, and even leave some of the growth back in the portfolio so that your principal payments can grow, and basically your principal of your portfolio will continue to grow and outpace inflation. So people have reached out to me and asked me, Mike, what do you think is the perfect portfolio? And it, again, it does depend on your risk tolerance. Maybe you like a 60% you know, stock equities and 40% real estate. Maybe you like 80% equities and 20% real estate. I'm basically subbing out bonds, treasury bills, fixed income for real estate because it operates the exact same way, has a very similar risk profile and about 800% higher returns. That's huge. So when the risk to reward is off balance, there's an opportunity. And I'm gonna use real examples in my market in London, in southwestern Ontario. I have examples in Calgary, um, examples out west in, in Newfoundland, in New Brunswick. I've tested this in pretty much every province. It is doable in every single province in Canada and all throughout the Midwest in the United States. Pretty much any place with a population of less than 500,000 people, it will work. And then even in some of the major metropolitans, it works as well. Just 
not as strongly. So you might have to rely on a 7% rule as opposed to an 8 or 9 or 10% uh, rule of withdraw from your portfolio. So what do I recommend for equities? People have been waiting for this video for a while. I like the all-in-one portfolios. I like the robo-advisors. They're simple. They're easy. You don't know more than the market. The guys who are day trading, most of them don't beat the market over a 25-year horizon. I can't pretend to know more than some of the greatest traders on Wall Street who we know, on average, most of the fund managers barely outperform the S&P 500 net of fees. So if they can't do it, what makes you think you can do it in the long term sustainably? You can't. Every trend, every pattern, every historical analysis chart you use, every model, it breaks. Psycho psychology models that people use to trade, that breaks. Um, people trade on, on many different things. There's like momentum traders. I've seen all the different types of trading style. Went to the Richard Ivey School of Business, studied value investing, and studied specifically finance. So I have a background and I still set it and forget it. So I like the Vanguard style ETFs, exchange traded funds. They're super low fees, like a quarter of a percent or less. And if you're buying mutual funds instead of ETFs, you're losing out on two to 3% potentially of value lost to fees to the fund managers every single year. And over a 30 to 50 year time horizon, you're talking about losing one, basically like a million to $2 million over the whole portfolio's life. That's a lot of fees compounded. So if you can buy ETFs, that's the way to go. I like VT, VTI, VEQT. These are like all in one equity focused, uh, purely equity focused is the important piece. So I wanna just own collections of stocks. I don't wanna own any fixed income or any bonds. The real estate percentage of my allocation is going to cover all that for me. It's gonna create that fixed income. So all I need to focus on is just the equity play. A lot of people are gonna also jump in the comments and say, Mike, I follow you because I love real estate and I wanna get invested in real estate. Why not 100% real estate? Because you should never have all your eggs in one basket, plus it's a lot easier to get mortgages and to finance when you can go take a huge stock portfolio and use that as your proof of down payment. Use that to qualify for, for debt. Go take that portfolio and borrow against it at three, four, five percent If you're a high net worth individual, totally doable. So that's something that's really attractive actually, is using the stock portfolio to buy real estate. So. Good to diversify, good to not have all your eggs in one basket. I'd like to own a small percentage of companies in Europe, China, Brazil, Russia, India, United States, and of course Canada, the country I'm living in. So I want to own small pieces of many different companies. I'm very diversified, very safe. If the real estate market turns, we know rents stay relatively flat, but imagine a situation where we were underwater on house prices, and imagine even rents came down a little bit and cash flows hurt. My equities are likely in a good position because I own stock all across the world. So just being diversified provides an extra layer of safety. Not that I believe the real estate market is going to ever just like explode in Canada. Um, I think that probably even if we had a pullback, I would still be in a lot of ways perfectly fine because I'm cash flow positive from rental income. And most people get priced out in a recession and then end up renting. So the data suggests that we'll probably be okay. Maybe there'll be higher vacancy periods and so factor those things in. But this is what I feel like is a good split for equities. Maybe 60-40, I see 70-30. I, I could see arguments in, in that range. But I think this is the perfect hybrid. Now into real estate, what do I mean by real estate? I mean rental properties or if you're unable to qualify for mortgages and you don't wanna partner with anyone and you don't wanna buy into any funds, any private local funds to buy into real estate, you could do some private lending. Here in Canada, you can go through companies like Olympia Trust to use your tax-free savings account to lend out first mortgages. Or your RRSP funds, sitting in your RRSP, lent out against real estate and generate you 10 or 12% returns in the first secured position. What I mean by that is you can go put a mortgage on a property, 70% loan to the value. So if the market dropped 20% and the person stopped paying you on this million dollar, not just a million dollar house, you put a $700,000 mortgage on it. You've got 70% loan to value. The person stops paying you their mortgage payments at 10 or 12% interest rate. You can then go and take the property, sell it, power of sale, very easy to do. You don't have to sue them, you just take the property back, get all your money back and all your interest and you're covered. It's very hard to lose money in a first secured position as long as you stay 75 to 80% loan to value or less. Be like the bank in this situation. And there are people out there right now in Canada willing to pay 10% rates of return. So you get on a million bucks, hundred thousand dollars a year from private mortgage lending way better than bonds, secured against Canadian real estate. If Canadian real estate did tank, the government will step in and stabilize. 
Think this through guys, it's a relatively safe investment. It feels to me, like especially if you're at 70% loan to value where you got 30% the market could correct and you're still not lost a single dollar. It feels a lot to me like treasury bills. It feels a lot to me like standard corporate bonds. In fact, less risky than standard corporate bonds but double or triple the returns. So very, very attractive. I also like to see this equities portfolio consisting of your tax-free savings account being maxed out. Take advantage of that. Your RRSP, max that out, take advantage of that. Use your tax registered accounts here or here. I wanna see you taking advantage of those as well. So it's not just about the asset allocation, it's about using it in a tax efficient way as well. When you're looking at a regular rental property, if I buy a $500,000 property, you can imagine, I have to put 20% down. That's a $100,000 down payment. As a random example, I've bought properties in London that are $150,000, $200,000 properties where the down payment's like 30 or 40 grand. Uh, I've even bought a property where the down payment was 20 grand before. But I'm just using a standard example just to prove the math. So $100,000 down payment, you've invested $100,000 of your capital, should produce one to $2,000 a month of profit just from rental income on a standard duplex or triplex in my market, in a lot of markets across Canada. That is very, very attractive in my opinion. Um, that kind of return is typically with mortgage pay down around a 15 to 20% annualized return because of the cheap debt the bank is giving you, that cheap mortgage debt. And so if you have a job right now, you can take advantage of that cheap debt, do that, and then retire. Your mortgages don't go away when you retire. They automatically refinance the mortgage for you. They send you, every time your fixed term comes up every five years in Canada, they'll offer you an automatic reapproval and it's usually at a pretty competitive rate without having to requalify. So even if you're retired, your mortgage will keep rolling over. You won't have to worry about it being like called on you or anything like that. And then appreciation is a, a beautiful little thing too. Appreciation, you're putting $1 for the bank putting $4. $100,000 down payment buys you a $500,000 asset. So if the house appreciates 3% with inflation, $500,000 house appreciates 3% with inflation, that's a $15,000 appreciation per year now you don't wanna bet on that, but I'm just saying like that's statistically what we've seen. You've got only one fifth of the money put up. So your $100,000 down payment just received the entire $15,000 in appreciation. That's a 15% appreciation return on the 3% appreciation that actually happened. So because you only put $1, for the $5 asset, you get five to one appreciation. That's the beauty of buying real estate with a mortgage. And unfortunately, I've adjusted the returns down because as you own your real estate, I assume you're not gonna refinance the property back up. You're gonna start paying it down, unfortunately. You only want that from a leverage perspective, from a max return on investment perspective. But as you pay on your mortgage, your return on investment gets lower. So these get lower as what ends up happening is you get 15% from cash flow and then around 11% from appreciation on average because you're gonna start paying down the property. So I've averaged it out over a 10 year period. You're in about a 26% rate of return, less inflation at 2%, gives you 24% return with rental properties. I've seen about 50% just from cash flow and minor appreciation. If we're in hot markets like we've been the last two years, triple digit returns in real estate are totally conceivable. But based just on rental income. So imagine a $200,000 property renting for $2,000 a month. That should produce about eight, about probably $700 to $1,000 a month in pure cash flow in your pocket. That's fantastic if you consider that that only required a $40,000 down payment. So to have $800 a month in rental income, plus you have mortgage pay down, plus you have appreciation, which you don't get right away, but it exists. You can refinance it out or sell it out to get that money out later. Just like your stocks are gonna appreciate, but you have to sell them to get the money out. It's a lot like a dividend. I, I look at real estate a lot like a dividend that pays like a 15% annualized return. It's just, it's ridiculous. Real estate is super overpowered. Not if you're buying real estate in cash. Like if you're just, if you're just putting cash or buying houses, like $250,000 cash to buy the house, the returns are, are kind of lackluster, like six to 8%. But when you lever up, when you use the bank's money to buy real estate, your money, so instead of buying one house in cash, you can buy five houses at 20% down. So it's the exact same amount of cash to buy one house all out in cash or to buy five houses 20% down. So that's why leverage makes things really attractive, especially if you're buying cash flowing real estate. So what ends up happening? You get your 7% annualized return on your equities portfolio, net of say 3% inflation. 3% is high for inflation. I went a little high just to be conservative gives you about a 4% net return, right? You're leaving, the reason I minus 3% is I'm leaving 3% in my portfolio, so my equities portfolio continues to grow each and every year. I'm withdrawing 4% to live on for my stock portfolio. That gives me 4% of my 8% total withdrawal, but my real estate portfolio is generating me 26% return because of leverage and because I'm buying cash flowing real estate, minus 
uh, for inflation gives you 24%. 24% return times 50% of my portfolio sitting there, 4% times 50% equals 2%. Right, because 50% of your portfolio is in equities, 50% of it is in real estate. So your 12% effective return gives you about an 8% safe withdrawal rate. In fact, if you didn't factor in that you're gonna pay down the properties, like I ran the numbers without, imagine if every three years you refinance the equity out, you'd have about a between 12 and 14% safe withdrawal rate, depending on the rental properties that you use in your area. It's really dependent on the cap rate, and cap rate is basically price to rental income you can get in your market. So in Toronto, maybe a million dollar house rents for like $3,000 a month. That rent to price is pretty bad. So your cash flow is not going to be near as strong. You might even be cash flow neutral. This doesn't work near as well. But in markets like London, where I am, or in markets like all across the Midwest, or anywhere really in Southwestern Ontario besides Toronto, like anywhere in the suburbs of Toronto, Pickering and all those areas around there, it, it does work. And so in Hamilton, it still works. In Niagara region, it still works. In Windsor, it still works. In Sarnia, it still works. In areas like Calgary, it's still working. In areas around uh, in BC, it's still working. All around, I've tested this in many different markets and it is working. So consider throwing in a few rental properties into the mix and find out you can retire that much sooner. The other alternative is the beautiful thing about FIRE is you can pick up a part-time job or pursue your hobby in retirement. And what you'll find is that if you brought in, say, if you need $25,000 a year to live, and you can pick up a part-time job doing what you love, make $1,000 a month, there's $12,000 that you don't need from your portfolio. So now you only need $13,000 in passive income to subsidize your living. That means you only need half the retirement portfolio that you needed before. So if you needed $500,000 before, now you need $250,000 to retire. So that's something to think about when you're working through, like maybe you're sitting at your desk right now and you're watching this video and you're thinking, I hate my job, I hate my boss, or it's Sunday night and you're watching this and you're like, Mike just dropped this video yesterday and I have to go to work tomorrow. And you're thinking, because every Saturday at noon I drop a video and every Wednesday I go live at 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you're thinking to yourself, I just don't wanna go into work tomorrow. How can I get this faster? Well, there's only three things you can do. You can learn to spend less, so you need less to retire and you save more faster. You can earn more or you can maximize the returns. And so part of maximizing the returns is having these types of conversations. What sort of asset allocations are you looking for? Do you want entirely a stock portfolio? Are you okay to mix in some rental properties? Do you want to hire property management to manage all of that? Or are you okay with managing all yourself and taking on that part-time job to earn that extra cash flow and off to pay a management fee? All things to consider, all things we're gonna discover and explore together on the channel in future videos. If you liked this content, if you like this style, please let me know. I'm gonna to try to do more whiteboard videos where I walk through some of the numbers. I want you guys to be able to create passive income you can live on forever that is inflation adjusted. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, and to build wealth as quickly as possible, is to have a 50% equities, 50% real estate split, um, to do it conservatively. If you wanna do it as fast as possible, just do it all in real estate. That's riskier, but again, is a faster way to get to financial independence and to retire early. So yeah, I really appreciate you guys watching and I'd like to see you in the comments and hear what you have to think about the 4% rule, about the 8% safe withdrawal rate, max mixing in real estate. Some people have thrown out 12% rule as possible with rental properties. Rental properties just can generate so much more cash flow because it's a levered return. Where else can you borrow at like 3% cost of debt, you know, 80% loan to value, you just can't buy five to one with stocks and it'd be a lot riskier because stocks don't produce consistent cash flow every month the way rental properties do from rental income. Um, so that's something that's really nice when the debt is paid for by the tenant. And so you're making profit each and every month. That's a good situation to be in. Plus you have the upside of appreciation and mortgage pay down. So it's a triple trifecta. Uh, I like to look at it as like my fixed income piece. To, I live on my rental properties. My equity piece provides that future growth. So I don't, I don't sell my stock really. I focus more on living on my rental income portfolio and then focus on uh, the long-term growth from the stock plays. And as things appreciate a lot, I'll rebalance my portfolio and sell off the, the higher plays and then get into more stocks and basically just buy more ETFs. So if an ETF gets overpriced, you could always look at buying another ETF as well. But uh, the beautiful thing with the ETFs are they rebalance for you. So that's something to think about too. I have my own little stock portfolio, but I do like ETFs, exchange traded funds. I do like things like Wealthsimple and Robo Advisors, where you can just set it to 100% equities and set it and forget it. That's, there's something really nice about that too, if you value your time and your sanity. So anyway, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you on the next video. See you in the comments. Hey everyone, 
Welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a great day today. We're talking about <coughs> and today I'm talking about how to how to mix in real estate and rental properties into your asset allocation of your portfolio. Start again. Yes, I guess so. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's Mike Rosehart here. We're talking today about the safe withdrawal rate and more specifically, how you could wrap rental properties. <coughs> Two, three. 